On December 3rd, Boston's Museum of African American History will celebrate its 50th anniversary. To tell us about the event, the genesis of the organization, and the history it brings to life is the museum's CEO, Maria Rivero. Thank you very much for being Thank with you. us, Maria. Thank you, Chris. I, I want to have you talk about the, the beginnings of, of this museum 50 mm -hmm. years ago, back when the African Meeting House was just a sort of another dilapidated old building on Beacon Hill. <laughs> It was that, it was that. These were the mid-60s, of course, the time of activism. And uh, the wife of a BU professor here, Sue Bailey Thurman, an amateur historian, found this building on Beacon Hill. You know, it was boarded up, rain was dripping through the roof, that kind of thing. And she enlisted the support of Henry Hampton, the filmmaker, to help her do something. So he looked at it and he thought, wow, Frederick Douglass spoke here, the black uh, 54th Civil Rights uh, Regiment was recruited here. This building has been here since 1806. He said, we have to fix this. Uh, and really, I think the next 50 years for us have been like a relay race. Just different people have come forward to volunteer, to sponsor events, to support it financially. And then they hand off another, you know, it's, it's really a relay race. But over the 50 years, we have fully restored the 1806 building. It's, it's uh, right behind the State House, really, on 46 Joy Street. Um, it won a National Preservation Award, beautifully done. The public school next to it was a black public school, if you can believe that, built in 1835, so that's been restored. Um, and I should say about that, uh, at first they said you couldn't teach English grammar. We'll give you the money to build the school, but you can't teach English grammar. And the black community there said, we're not, we're not building a school if you can't teach English. Um, so that was built. That whole side of Beacon Hill was the black community. It kind of moved up from the north end and was on that uh, north slope of Beacon Hill for the 17 and 1800s. Then that community moved off and it became a Jewish synagogue uh, through from 1900 to about 1960. Then that community left uh, and the museum founded again, maybe four years later. It was sold back and forth for a dollar or something. Uh, and the this last 50 years began. So we're in our 50th year. Um, around uh, the 1970s, a group from Nantucket family said, we have an African meeting house, a small one, on Nantucket, built in 1820. Uh, we restored that. And we're the, almost finishing the adjacent uh, buildings uh, in Nantucket, which were uh, the home of the parents of a black whaling captain, we, we hear about sometimes. We had 200 men under sail at Absalom, Boston. This is his parents' home. They built it in 1774. So on Nantucket, starting in about 1730, there was a black community that owned property. They were part of the whaling uh, industry, which was uh, lucrative. Um, and they were very involved, as they were here, in progressive work to integrate education in the state to uh, end slavery. So they weren't sort of sitting here in the north thinking, well, we're fine and, uh, you know. Well, you know, I, I went to a historic school in Boston, a public uh, school, uh, very conscious of its history, and I never heard any of what you just told me. So talk, why is that important to get this on the map? You know, we really, especially in this time, when people seem to be questioning who an American is, who's an American, uh, we were all here, truthfully. We were all here, and it's important for all of us to understand that because the images we have in our brains about who was here, what they were doing, uh, has really not been expanded in the way that it should have been. So it's hard to engage uh, really with these issues of citizenship, I think, right now, uh, and of agency and activism, et cetera, right now, without all of us understanding that we were all here. And especially in Boston and uh, our part of the country, which was a major seaport uh, and major maritime uh, area. We had everyone here. Caribbean people were here, Latin American people were here, Mediterranean, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asian people here, African people. This whole area was an amazing melting pot. And of course, it was smaller than this now. Uh, so people knew one another. And when you start going back in the historic records, you see that. Uh, so when we're trying to take up issues having to do with immigration, say, migration, uh, cross-cultural understanding. All of those stories are really embedded in our own history here in Boston. And um, 
it allows us to think about one another differently, I believe. You know, when you know where you've been, you know who's been standing behind you, you know that we worked across race, we worked across class, we ended slavery together. There are many things we can do together if we understand uh, who we are. This is uh, being a news, and we're talking with Marita Rivera from the Museum of African American History. Mm -hmm. Marita, tell me about the gala event you've got coming up on December oh, yeah. 3rd. Well, that's fun. The <laughs> gala's fun. So every year, uh, we, we have an annual event. The museum in 1806, the African Meeting House itself, opened uh, in December in 1806. Our gala this year is at the Four Seasons, as it has been for years past. And it is a chance for us to come together, to gather, to get renewed energy from one another, to learn a little bit about the history again of our time, and to celebrate uh, people we call our living legends. Uh, this year, it's Dr. Tony Coles, who's an immunologist and a CEO of a pharmaceutical company that's doing wonderful work, uh, and author uh, and educator Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Um, and we celebrate people who obviously had extraordinary careers, built extraordinary careers, but they have also engaged in wonderful philanthropy. They've also participated in building the communities they're part of, uh, through boards, through other kinds of work. And finally, they're just people with great personal integrity. Uh, so our living legends over the years have been uh, quite a, a wonderful mix, whether it's Senator Ted Kennedy, for example, Bill Russell, uh, the lawyer Margaret Burnham from, from uh, the Restoration Justice Project, and other notable people. So last year, Wayne Budd, attorney, a wonderful attorney here in Washington, and Lonnie Bunch, the new director of the Smithsonian's uh, Museum of African American History and Culture, were our living legends. So we invite people to come. Uh, you can get tickets on our website, um, but it's just an evening when we, we give an award. We have an award part of the program. We have a wonderful buffet uh, reception and, uh, and open up a, an after party at 6.30. It's a Sunday uh, with music and performance. Well, one of the things that, that's happened over the years is you've had the restoration of the meeting house, and now maybe it's almost a, a routine event. You've got people <laughs> coming in the building and, and looking around. Uh, uh, whether it's kids growing up here or, or foreign tourists, mm -hmm. uh, what's it like when you see them coming in there and they're, they're oh. learning something that, that's totally new? It's amazing. I mean, maybe 30,000 people come through every year, let's say. Uh, it's very interesting to see our international visitors. We have a sizable group of people who are trying to understand American democracy and American history and slavery, uh, and they have questions. How did this happen? When did it end? Who ended it? What did they say? We're women involved. Uh, uh, all of those kinds of questions are part of what happens, which we encourage when you, when you show up. Uh, right now we have an incredible Frederick Douglass exhibit. He, he will be, it's his 200th birthday, uh, Valentine's Day 2018. Uh, and so we put up an exhibit. Um, he spoke at the museum. He was a wonderful abolitionist. Um, but we're really looking at that connection between activism and civic responsibility and technology, because the camera just showed up uh, when he was first out as a 20-year-old. He was 20 one of the most old. photographed people in the 19th century. One of the most photographed, and he recognized right away that a camera could control his image. He was seeing all those odd stereotypes and cartoons of black men. So we're just looking at the way people with a message begin to learn how to use the latest media, the same way we use a, cell, a smartphone uh, now or in the civil rights era, uh, people used electronic media, those pictures of the dogs, the attack dogs, the fire hoses, were so integral a part of how people began to think about what was happening. So for Douglas, it was the phone. He was saying, this is how a black man looks. This is how I present myself. Uh, and they traded his pictures the way you trade, dragotypes types the way you trade uh, baseball cards. Right? Well, we should mention you've got uh, some samples on your website and more information about events coming up. So what's the place that so people should do. go to? Our website is maah.org, Museum of African American History. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Marita Rivero from the Museum of African American History. We'll have more news in just a moment.